Welcome to Point to Rise, your podcast that gives you permission to dream big, take messy action, and turn your talent into profit while turning your back on perfection. My name is Suzanne Purcell, high performance and mindset coach, former international ballerina, profitable entrepreneur, and founder of Point to Rise, a movement designed to empower dancers. It is my mission to use my own story as an inspiration for today's generation of dancers. And now sit back, stretch, warm up, or zip your coffee and love learning how much it matters to point at yourself first to rise to all that you are capable of. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Point to Rise podcast. Our guest today is Kelly McCauley. She is a dance educator and creative director living in the greater Boston area. As a daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of dance studio owners, she always thought her family was in the dance studio business. Kelly today is exploring what she now understands her family's legacy to be the business of dance. Kelly calls up on 15 years as a professional writer to help dance professionals discover the power of storytelling of the stage. Kelly has written for Dance Spirit and brands like JetBlue, Jack Daniels, Duncan, and the National Geographic Channel. She is a graduate of the Oklahoma City University and Boston University and has been teaching with colleges of the Fenway Dance for more than 10 years. I am so excited about this conversation because it is not often that we actually mm, have the courage to compare arts, dance, to business and that there is actually so much alike and so much that we can draw from to make dance, the business of dance better. So without no further ado, here's our conversation. Enjoy. Her name is Beth. She always announces herself. You yes. named her? I, I did. I, I had to that. because I'm like, what are you doing? I love that. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much for being here. I am so mm, not only honored, but just so grateful for connecting with, with other women in this space, in the art space, in the dance space that are truly, you know, not only changing, but, but having the courage to look at other perspectives and looking outside of the bubble that we've been put into for so many um, decades. So Thank you for having this conversation with me. Of course, thank you for for inviting me to chat with you and um, reaching out and connecting. It's my favorite thing to do is connect with other people and, and have shared experiences. Mm, I love that. Yes, and isn't that so much what we actually really need in the arts to connect with each other? Um, because it can get so lonely. It actually is really lonely. Um, I find that the industry is set up that way, you know, put your blinders on, look forward, don't look to the sides. That is not where we learn. That's not how we evolve. This is not how we step into, I would say, another evolution of the art form. And I feel like the pandemic, despite all the bad things that have happened, has basically pushed us into that um, necessity to connect more with other people and understand, hey, where are you at? I'm struggling here. What what can we do together? So tell, tell our listeners a little bit about you. I know you and I chatted already, and I feel like I, I've taken the, the plug out, <laughs> I want to say, but it would be lovely to, um, when, I, when I recorded your intro, um, you have written for magazines. You are all about telling stories, not only on stage, but more off stage. So we actually can relate to what these people, are, who these people are and what is their background story in order to have a deeper connection with each other. Yeah, no, that's to say I'm all about stories is definitely true. Um, I think there is such power in stories and storytelling and when you think about your life in it next to a story and next to stories you really start to see how that can be true 
from the time we're children, everything we're taught is usually through a story. You think about fables and, and tales and, and things that are teaching you right from wrong and not to cheat and not to tell lies. And we learn all that through all these famous stories that you can think about and all the new stories that are still out there waiting to be written and waiting to be told. And um, I just, I remember growing up loving listening to stories and books and reading. And even aside from that, the stories you see on TV and in movies and just how captivating stories can be from an educational perspective. And then also from a connection standpoint, as you just spoke about, you know, it is the way that we tend to talk to each other. We tell each other stories about our lives. It's the way that we connect with each other. And it's how we develop empathy with someone else is by having a moment where you're hearing something probably through a story and you're like, oh, I can relate to that. Um, so storytelling is just super important to humans <laughs> in general. I can just say that I like it's statement to humans. That is um, how a way that our humanity has evolved and storytelling has always been a part of that. And in my life, that has really manifested itself in, in my career um, as a professional writer. You know, I've written for magazines, like you said, and then I also work as a copywriter and I've told stories for brands big and small, some that we are all familiar with and then some that maybe we don't know, but maybe someday we will because of their story and because of what they have to share and what they have to offer. Mm. So two things came up for me. First, you reminded me of my childhood. So I was left alone quite often and we had a record player and all the Grimm's, um, how do you say it in fairy English? Tale. Fairy tales were on vinyls. Yeah. So what I would do is just put that on and act out the story that I was listening to and dancing to because they were underlaid with music. Right. Um, so thank you for bringing that memory back. I mean, I played them every day. They had scratches everywhere. Um, I think we still have them at home. Oh, wow. And um, the second thing, which I just forgot, so we're going to scratch the second thing. That was really what came up for me. Um, when we're talking about stories, now in an entrepreneurial, um, from an entrepreneurial perspective and from a business perspective, every business really builds their brand or, or who they are in a world up on a story. It either comes from the story of the founder of why they did that, um, the story of the product. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I find that in, in arts and performing arts, in dance particularly, um, we have not tapped into that possibility yet. And I wonder, A, if you agree, and B, why is that? Yeah, I... Um... I definitely think that there are some industries where storytelling has become more important than others. And like you said, like from a business standpoint in the world of dance, it doesn't seem like storytelling has made its way as much from the stage to the, the marketing side, if you will, the business side as much as some others. And, um, I don't know exactly why that is. Um, you know, I think part of it is, is that as artists, we tend to focus so much on our art and we want to focus so much on our art form and developing that. Um, that's the other stuff. Sometimes we lose track of it. Sometimes it falls to the side and sometimes there's just not enough time to, to focus on bringing that to life outside of the art that you are trying to perfect and the craft that you're trying to hone. Um, yeah. Okay. Can I, I'm going to piggyback on that because when you say there, we, we think there's not enough time to tap into the story or we're putting the artistry or the, pro, the production and the making of and the rehearsing as the number one priority. 
don't we expect at that point that people are just coming to us to see us and we forget that we are actually running a business that is entailing promotion, that is entailing telling a story to connect with our audience. Because quite frankly, um, you know, the audiences that are coming right now into the theater are not the people that are going to sit there in the next 20 years, meaning that as, as the industry, we have to advance our thinking in terms of, okay, how can we tell stories, as you said, because we relate to it, that the younger generation actually is enthralled to come and see us, that they are curious, that they understand that sitting in a theater perhaps is definitely worth their time and their money. Right. Yeah. Right. I think there's there's a lot in there, right? You know, one of the first things that came to mind when you're when you're speaking about the artistry and and selling is that there is this um, almost it's almost built into the culture that as an artist you don't want to be a sellout, right? Story. So, yeah you don't want to be out there selling and selling that's a story we're telling ourselves as artists is that like oh i'm an artist i can't be salesy and that's just not true if you don't tell your story and sell yourself no one else will no one's gonna do it for you i think we can end this podcast because that <laughs> that just last little sentence it is one thousand percent the truth and uh, I have to admit, I never saw myself as, you know, the product, like I am my business and I am here to have the world look at me and there will be people that like my story and there will be others to not like my story. And I need to be okay with that, first of all, right? right. Understanding that performing arts has something to do with business. Um, we have the story wrapped around our, I don't know, the industry for so many decades that arts and business doesn't fit together. Business is bad. It's a, a sellout. It's, um, oh, how do you say that? It's, um, it's dirty. It's bad. It's not Slimy. okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's filthy. It's um, not loyal. And we've never have looked on the other side. It's like, how are we actually running performing arts organizations? How do ballet companies um, function? And I have to say, and I'm very, being very blunt here, that asking donors to give money and then tailor the repertoire towards their needs or hiring the people they want to see on stage, that is, in my opinion, a sellout because you're depending on somebody else's opinion yep and yep. you're you are powerless and we're not it is this you know there's one perspective and yes it has worked for such a long time but we have not worked on what other perspectives we can lean into how else can we look at producing performing arts um i i want to know since you've been in you know dance school like your entire family has been in the industry for such a long generational time. How did you, when did you start asking the questions? It's like, hmm, how can we, like, what if, what if we would look at it from a different perspective? Oh, um, it's, it's tough. I don't think that I realized, um, I think the moment I realized we could look at it from a different perspective was when I realized what my family's business, if you will, what my family business really is. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't, you know, just to give some background context to that, um, I'll just quickly run down that my, my mother owned dance, two dance studios, my grandparents, owned a dance studio together. Before that, they each owned their separate dance studios before they got married. And my great grandmother um, ran a dance studio 
back in the 1920s, 1930s in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so you look at that story and you're like, oh, they're in the family business of dance studios, right? The dance studio was the was the business, but when I when I look back at it now, I realize that that's not what what the family business is. The family business is the business of dance. And I didn't see that probably until I was, oh gosh, I mean, I was an adult by the time I realized that. And just thinking about where, where do I fit into that legacy, if you will, where, where does my, where, where am I part of that? Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes you have to take that step back to see what the big picture, what the big story is and where do you fit into, where does, where does your life fit into that story of dance and, and where do you fit into it? But also like, what's that bigger picture of, of where dance fits in the world for you? If that makes, that's, that feels really big. I know. <laughs> to, to no, think no, 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 no. I, I, so if it feels big to you, I totally honor that, but it doesn't feel big to me at all because it is, it is asking bigger questions. Mm -hmm. That's when we receive bigger answers. Right. And I feel that, um, and I, particularly in North America, even companies that are professional are still being treated because they don't see themselves as big enough or not asking the questions that really needed to be asked, um, they're being treated as just something dispensable and not that important. That's why companies chase money all the time. That's why surviving the, the um, pandemic was so hard. Mm -hmm. That's why so many companies actually had to close doors because they did not have multiple streams of income. They were not looking at the company as a business. Right. Now, there is nothing wrong with running a non-for-profit, but what I don't agree with is treating your organization as a cause. The arts are not a cause. The dance is not a cause. It is a business and it should be run as such. And I truly believe that if we're actually applying business models, um, business mindset, business structures in these companies, that we would see less abuse. Mm. Because that was one other thing that started boiling up like a volcano um, during the pandemic. You know, more and more people started speaking up about all the things that they've been through. It gave me the permission to say, hey, um, here, me too. Right. 30 years ago, what you're talking about is what I went through 30 years ago, and we're still perpetually um, doing the same thing. Is that sustainable? Is it really that we have to suffer as dancers, as artists? Do we really have to starve and, and be okay with exposure? Right, right. Can you really pay your bills with exposure? I, I couldn't. Oh. <laughs> All right, no. <laughs> No, they're not going to pay themselves and they're certainly not going to pay themselves just to have your name somewhere. It's not, it's not a way to live. And no, be, and like you're saying, because it's not, we, um, we, we need to treat our, our either ourselves as dance professionals or our companies that are dance based as corporations, right? Exactly. And, and not just, like you said, not a cause, not just art. It's more than that. Oh, it is much more than that. Yeah. The product itself does not only spend a horrendous amount of money and training to get there, but they are also giving so much time towards that goal to become a professional in their field of art. And we're not valuing that at all because there is no per se touchable product maybe produced. It is a feeling that we're selling. It is a story line that we're enacting and, and selling. It is beauty and grace that is being sold. Right. That doesn't matter. That, that shouldn't mean that it's worth less than a car or 
an air filter or whatever you know you're selling mm -hmm. um so let's pivot a little bit here is here here is my thought i've heard not only once that some studio owners not only work their tails off and only trade their time for money but i also heard that many schools raise money in order to sustain themselves um what are your thoughts around that well i mean i can tell you firsthand that a studio owner does work their tail off because i saw that in my life um you know my i i saw that in my family for years and years and uh I couldn't be more proud of my family and all the work they put in and, and all the students they taught. And, um, you know, I, I just read a quote and I'm, I digress a little bit, but I just read a quote about how in life we as people are lucky, you know, if six people remember us, I think was the number. Whereas a teacher, you probably have hundreds of people who remember you. Um, so the, the value there is is probably immeasurable of, of what that teacher or, or dance studio owner is doing in their community and in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, the fact that some dance studios, some dance schools also on top of that raise money to sustain their business and their livelihood, it's very unfortunate to say the least that that's what we have to do. Um, it, the solution is, I don't think there's an easy one by any means. Um, you know, as a parent myself, you know, you, you do, you look at the prices on different things and different activities and you, some are more expensive than others. And I think that studio owners tend to know that they tend to know that dance comes off as one of the more expensive extracurriculars for students. Um, now, if you if you have a student in dance and a student in hockey, you might not feel so because I hear hockey is also very expensive. There are some very expensive sports as well. I know that for a fact. Um, but it's the the value doesn't seem to be there, and so it gets back to that value proposition that we've been dancing around. Um, <laughs> and, oh, I love that. <laughs> and uh, what, what, why isn't the value placed on that? Like, what haven't we done to make sure that the community sees value in what we are doing to change future generations? So just that the changing the generational um, stories, you know, um, being okay with, with asking, hey, does this still apply for today? Uh, what if we could actually run a profitable business? What would that feel like? What would that enable us to do? And what would that mean for future generations? And I think that is really truly where we have to start to not resign ourselves to, well, it is just what it is and it never is going to change, to have the courage to say, hey, it has been working so far, but I am growing tired of it and I want something more. And isn't that exactly where the change really comes in, where we start the conversation and versus coming from a place of lack, actually looking at the possibilities that are out there nowadays I mean, your Instagram feed is full of possibilities on how you can market a dance studio and what other options you could possibly have to, to have um, build different streams of revenue. I mean, if we just look at a dance studio as, as, a, as a business and, and what kind of revenue streams there are, right? It's classes. That's how you build your revenue. And, and my question would be, okay, what else can you do? Like, how right. else could you make money? Right. Can you have an online program? Can you have courses that are evergreen and produce money consistently? 
Can you hold workshops? Can they be outside of the city? Who can you collaborate with to, you know, perhaps have more students? It's, it's the belief that we are only bound, and I'm saying we here, um, to the city or the community that we're in. And we're not looking at the possibility to tapping into 7.8 billion people. Right, right. And not, not to get off topic, uh, and this is this is related. It is related. Um, you know, I think a lot of dancers, dance teachers, go into the business of dance, of owning a dance studio, because we love dance. We don't love business necessarily, or some of us don't even maybe know about business. And it definitely, um, I, I saw a conversation on Facebook page recently about. Um, you know, what do you wish you knew when you opened your dance studio? And I saw that come up a lot is that it's one thing to love dance, but you have to run the business. You have to love the business. And, and all these questions you're asking, how else can we do it? This, how else, that's that business mindset that, you know, as a studio owner, you have to be, you're an owner of a business. You have to be in that mindset, but even taking a little step back as a dance professional, you also need to be in that mindset. Even if you're not, especially if you're not the studio owner and you're working gigs, which is totally, you can create a livelihood that way. I believe it, but you have to be in that business mindset. And I think over the past year and a half, I've seen in my community of friends and dancers and peers, the difference between dancers with that business mindset and dancers with the gig to gig mindset. Mm, okay. So what is the difference? And I, I, can you, can you remember that question? Because I want to just divert a little bit and expand your thought. And it's, it's not only dancers opening dance studios or their own classes or what have you, it is pulling principals into artistic directorships. It's pulling them in, expecting them just because they were a star on stage. And I don't wanna diminish that, but being a star on stage does not mean that you are a great leader. And we're forgetting that artistic directors have to be leaders, particularly now. They're not the face to attract donors well, they, right. they are, that's why they're hired. Um, but that's a non-for-profit kind of, that's an old kind of thinking. Right. I think, and that's another reason why all of these traditions have been moved from generation to generation to generation, because we're pulling in the same people, not healing, not doing the work. Um, and then, you know, thinking they're in power and then they can just do whatever has been done to them to others because hurt people hurt people Amen. you just it is it is what it is and if we're not healing as an industry together like if not everybody does their part it's not going to change right i just wanted to throw that in there but tell me what what was the difference between the gig to gig to the business mindset right we you, I'm going to build off one thing and then I'm going to go to business. Okay, business good. Business. We'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> the thing you said um, about pulling people in to fill that role, it reminds me of how you can be the best dancer in the room. You can be the best dancer on the stage, but that doesn't mean that you're the best teacher. You might be able to dance it, but you might not be able to break it down and teach it. And that goes back to that. You might be the best dancer, best dance teacher, but you might not be the best studio owner. And that's all about like owning your strengths and knowing what they are and really looking within yourself. Like, like you say, look within yourself to rise. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but to get back to the question, the difference between that business mindset and that gig to gig mindset is over the past year and a half, I have seen people, it, it's really, the difference is 
Um, are you making the opportunity or are you waiting for the opportunities? <laughs> that's just, that's I'm like- gonna <laughs> drop the mic right here. Yes, exactly. And in companies, aren't we waiting? Like haven't, I have been taught, no, you have to wait until it's given to you. You are not the creator. I'm using my words, but you're not in charge. You can't do that. Um, you have to wait until you're chosen. And that's, that's the way that we've always, I mean, that's what an audition is, right? The audition is your opportunity to go show something, but you're waiting to be called upon. Whereas that business mindset is maybe the audition's one opportunity, but maybe a $15 Zoom membership monthly is my other opportunity to start teaching a class. Um, you know, I, the benefit, I, I have a, you know, corporate, I've worked in corporate and I love it because I can find so many um, congruencies between the corporate world and the dance world. Yes. <laughs> And things that we're not taking advantage of, you know, um, one of the things that is rewarded in the corporate world is when you show initiative to do something, to bring an idea forth, to, you know, find a way to meet a goal. You, you, you hear about, and I'm not in sales, but you hear about salespeople making their quota or exceeding their quota. And no one is telling them to call this person call this person say that like they get trained but they're not they're not you know told to do those things they're they're going out and doing it and we don't have um other quotas to reach as dancers we find that we need to fulfill ourselves and so no one's setting these expectations for us so we're doing what we think we need to do to meet these imaginary quotas when really, what would it look like to exceed your own quota? Mm -hmm. What is that quota actually? And we're not talking about 10 periods or being complete, like being perfect or giving 500% every single day. That is not what we mean because one could think, oh, okay, so if I show up perfect every single day, then, I will, that's right. not what we're talking about. No, it's definitely, all those things are quantifiable, but this is, it is that more, it's not that artistry that's quantifiable. It's that, it's almost like livelihood. With what, how can you succeed on that front that lets you, have goals outside of the 10 pirouettes. Your goal might be to be the best dancer, but what does that get you? What do you want from that? And, you know, we are taught, maybe we are led to believe that it is the star role, that it is to perform on certain stages for certain choreographers, you know, certain companies, but you can only do that for so long. So that can't be the end goal. It's it um, can be one goal, right? It can, it can be, goal. yeah, it can, it can, can be a season perhaps. But if you have that as your end goal, when you finally make it, and I put that in quotes, when you finally make it, where do you go from there? Mm. And it's, it's great to create new goals and change your path and you can do that. But if we start thinking of these goals in a broader spectrum, can we make them all work together so that we're moving toward a bigger end goal for life? So that is a very, vulnerable and interesting point because I think, hmm. so let me share what my experience was when I started at an elite school in East Germany. We had to actually sign a waiver saying that from this point forward, we are not going to participate in any other 
outside activities. So these are still formative years. I, I enrolled there when I was 10 years old. So I was automatically programmed my subconscious that I cannot be interested in anything else if I want to make it, if I want to make it through the eight years, if I want to get the job that I wanted to, if I want to dance the roles. Um, and that is such a blinders on one way street highway, only have receiving one stream of income lifestyle that just does not apply in 2021 anymore. Like we as a society have moved so much away from the nine to five, giving it all, building somebody else's dream. And we're so much more into, okay, what does my own power look like? What do I want? How can I help other people? Um, and I, I, I truly believe if we were to really tap into that and, and really um, focus on taking our power back as an industry, meaning that allowing diversity, not not, necess not only racially and, and, and gender, but also um, knowledge and activity wise. And I'm not talking about knowing all the styles of dance. That's not, it's great, good job. Um, but what else is there? Like, yeah. could you um, have a coach? Can you tap into your story? Can you see that you have something to offer? Find find your story how can you help how can you influence right. not through brands but through you know sharing your own own story through your own journey what you've learned and with you tapping into your past you are giving the permission for others to do the same and you're laying the foundation for a better future yeah so how are we going to change that, Kelly? What are we going to do? Well, uh, I can we solve that in a podcast? Oh, totally. Let's talk about this. I am very outspoken. I love it, man. I I do. I mean, the things that you speak of happening are still happening about signing waivers and not wanting dancers to do other things and and it's not even not just doing other things but it's not dancing with anyone but the studio which kills me that kills me like um let it out girl it's okay <laughs> we can't be frustrated together it's okay oh it just it it, it pains me so much because you, you can learn so many things from different teachers and and grow in so many different ways and things that won't click at one studio for you will click if you go to a master class with another teacher and it's just it's you know it's crazy to think that we're still living in such a like narrow-minded industry that we won't let people be more well-rounded in their training in some communities and i know not everyone's like that i know that there are educators out there who are encouraging their students to to dance everywhere anywhere any way they want and really learn as much as they can about their body and their mind and their artistry and their path um and i have seen those changes i've seen coaching and resources for dance teachers to incorporate more of a well-rounded balanced lifestyle and and mental health aspect into their training um but it's just not as widespread as we want it to be and part of that is just because we fall into what's comfortable and what we know right yes, and we do yes, we, we have dance studios that have been in existence for a hundred years and it's hard to change something that's been happening for a hundred years and it takes it takes the right kind of personality to bring that change to what's been happening 
and what, mm -hmm. while some of it might be working, keep the good stuff, but let's release the things that aren't working. Let's let them go. Yeah. It's okay for them to go. It's not something that we need to hold on for, to for dear life. And I even go so far in saying that I, I understand. I understand that we're fearful of trying new things because trying these new things, um, we're taking the risk for them not to work. Right. Um, and with, with that, that that is a risk many company owners are not willing to, not owners, directors are not willing to take because their board is agent. They have, I'm saying it, like most of the board members are well into their third part of their seasons. And they've been following the train of how, you know, boards in the arts work and, and how they operate. And I get that it's hard. I get it. Mm -hmm. And that's why every single person involved in dance and acting, playing, comedy, whatever it is you do, it's where it starts. It starts with every single one of us really looking at yourself and at the stories that you're telling yourself that are in your subconscious that you're taking for granted that money is bad, money is the root of all evil, all of these things. Like how true are they actually? Are they actually true? Or did you just lean into them because it is comfortable and it suits your, your current state of mind? Right, right. I'm, I'm so glad you brought story back into this and the stories we're telling ourselves. And it just made me think of when, when we are thinking about pushing forward as a business, as either as a person or a company or a brand or a studio, um, I think we can find some really great examples in the dance world where story is working and is starting to change um, how people view dance or how people think of dance. And what kind of stories? Okay, so this is gonna be, this could be kind of controversial because- oh, Bring it on. Um, I think, you know, people look at commercial dance and um, the Hollywoodization of dance and dance training a little bit differently, depending on what school of thought you're coming from. So love it or hate it, you know, Hollywood has grasped onto the fact that people like to watch good dancers and we've made shows out of it, right? Yeah. Dancing with the stars. So you think you can dance world of dance. You've got all these shows where dance is making someone a lot of money advertisers are paying money to be a part of these shows and as a dancer and i've heard this from other dancers the part of the show that i like to watch is the dancing right i'm one of those i'll record it and i'll fast forward through all of the other bits the talking but 90 percent of the people watching the 90 percent who aren't dancers they're watching the stories. Yes. They're watching the drama. the drama, the backstory of the dancer from wherever and what they've been through and what their family's like and, you know, what it means to them to be dancing. It's storytelling. It's all that around it. And so to say that we can't bring story to dance and and change the way that it's perceived is such, it's just, I can't believe it because I see it happening. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And and let, let's let take Alex Wong, right? Like his story yeah. was amazing. And look where he is now, like what kind of a brand he yeah. has built for himself with the ability of that show, sharing his story. Um, and it wasn't all that successful in the beginning, but people bought into the journey. Yep. Um, yep. 
and that can that can be everybody yeah literally everybody and that's what we're forgetting that well that's him you know he could do all of these crazy tricks well if you really look at it and alex i love you i think you're the bomb um if you're listening but the tricks you do are the same ones and that's okay you know there is nothing nothing outside of that 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 is like magnetic or but what he does is great yeah yeah and we all so, have that we all have and, that exactly and every single one of us has that and that is why diving really into your story is so important understanding who you are and what your superpowers are that's your life threat yeah I was standing in a room of like 50 other entrepreneurs, I remember two and a half years ago. And I was asked, so Suzanne, what is your superpower? I'm like, <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> well, you all maybe have a superpower, but not me, you know? And I was like, ah, yeah. So I have some work to do. But that was my my um my branding, my my knowledge about myself up until this point. Because I thought if I talk about myself, what I'm capable of, I'm arrogant, I'm perceived as know it all or want to stand in the spotlight or, or, or whatever the stories around there are. Um, can we, before we get into putting the spotlight on you, on, on your business, what you're doing now, I, I want to define that there are stories that we live through that make us us and brought us to where we are right now. And then there are also stories that we're telling ourselves all the time that actually keep us from growing. Do you mind digging a little bit deeper into what I'm saying right now here? Yeah, certainly. I think that you're exactly right. There are, well, there are many types of stories and the two that you outlined there are probably the ones that clash most within our heads, within our hearts, even. Um, the stories that you tell yourself um, are the ones that maybe have been ingrained in you because of things that have been said to you, things you've read, things you believe, things in the news, things in pop culture. Um, the story, it's the self-doubt that creeps in it's the negative feelings that that come up and it's so natural for all those feelings to come up and for all those thoughts to come into your head because our human reaction is to protect ourselves so we are constantly seeking out whatever's out to get us in quotes i say that out to get us we're seeking out these okay. negative thoughts and this this oh i'm not good enough or i can't do that because and and that's, I mean, it's, it's primal. It, the, the thinking I'm talking about is primal. You're always on the hunt for, or you're always on the lookout for what's going to get you. Is that in one day, it might've been a bear, but today it's, I'm not thin enough. Right. And that's, that's out to get me that I am not good enough. I'm that story I'm telling myself it's coming up because I'm, I'm trying to protect myself. The experiences that we've lived through that really shape us, on the other hand, are the ones that we can actually pull strength from. They're the ones that get us asking the questions that are the headlines to our stories. You know, you think about what have you overcome or what has been a transformative moment in your life? and you can probably start to think of things that you've lived through that those are the the headlines of of your life almost and you think about what's something i've learned what would i tell my younger self about that that's a really fun one to think about what you would teach your younger self um you know you you think about when have i changed course when have i done a 180 you know when what was what were what are these moments in my life that really kind of had this you know revelation and it doesn't mean that the sky opened up and the butterflies danced around you and the angels were singing 
it doesn't have to be that's not what it has to be it's just a moment where you're like where you're thinking i see myself where i am now and i i know that i'm happy or that i know i need to make a change or that i know i'm making a difference these are all feelings that we have that we can draw strength from they're moments where we feel very sure of who we are or what we've done and you might not always see them until you look back on them hindsight really is 2020 when it comes to crafting your story that you're sharing with others yes Beautiful. Thank you. Um, while you were talking, just on a side note, there's like a huge thunderstorm over there in the east and the lightning just <laughs> touched down. I was like, oh, wow, you are moving mountains, lady. So <clears throat> tell us, um, who, what you're creating right now? Who is it for? Like, who's your ideal client? Um, where can we find you? You have some freebies. There is like ample of content on your IG on how to create content for your um, social media, why it is important that you have a social media presence. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's just been, it's really great to speak about the power of storytelling with you and speak about it to the dance world in this way. Um, I, I love the message that you're sending and the stories you're bringing to life are really helping us move forward, move upward and move beyond where we are right now. So thank you for, for sharing all the, the, these moments with me. Um, I, I love, um, storytelling as we know, and the place where I love to do it most right now is two places. It's Instagram and, um, on my email newsletter, which, uh, it, it's, I love to share ideas for how dance professionals can share their stories. A lot of that is tactical. Like you said, my Instagram feed is full of ideas of ways you can tell your story and different angles you can come at and different really tactical post ideas that you can do. But on a level deeper than that, I also work with one-on-one -on -one clients to discover their brand story, if you will, their personal story, if they're a professional not associated with a company um, or a, a, a studio necessarily. Um, we work one-on-one -on -one to develop that, what's that elevator pitch story that you would tell somebody. We work on what are your values and what are those core messages that you keep coming back to again and again. Um, and what keeps you grounded in, in what you do based on who you are and where you want to go. And it is um, fun work to dig into our personas in that way. It's um, exciting to me to, to actually write those stories. And uh, that's something I do one-on-one -on -one with clients. And if you're not ready for that level of uh, soul searching <laughs> or, um, just not quite to the place where you feel like you want to dig in, I do offer some one-off templatized social media prompts and templates that can help you share your story on social media. So it's, there's kind of a couple different ways that I am trying to share my talents with the dance world. 
So I just want to amplify your message here that have had I had somebody that I could have leaned into that would have coached me through and, and basically guided me through all the insecurities that I had around who I was and would have helped me discover my story and my with that comes when we discover our story with that comes letting go of shame of something that we haven't talked about perhaps it's letting go of fears that we were holding on to and it really really gives us the permission to become who we truly are and then some so it is not a being on the fence or not you as a dancer you're not only made in the studio your tendus and your plies and, and whatever you practice every day is part of your training. There is so much more around that, like knowing your core values, knowing what success looks like for you, knowing who you want to be and as what do you want to present yourself, knowing your strengths, knowing where you want to be in, in 20 years and being able to change your mind and giving yourself permission to change your mind. So these are all things that are so imperative in a career because with knowing all of these things, it not only gives you certainty in yourself, but it gives you a power to say no to things that are not right anymore. It gives you no to somebody not wanting to pay you for the job that you're doing. It gives you the power to say no if your director tells you to lose another five pounds in order to get the principal role. And that's why we're having these conversations to empower you to say no to the things that are not okay. So find your story, find out who you are. You don't have to be fitting into this tiny little box that um, companies and, and schools still perpetuate. Um, and follow the story outline that has been built over decades on what a great dancer has to look like. It's time for change and you start that. So with that, I have one more question. So with everything that you know now, <laughs> what would you ask your 16 year old self? Like you get the chance to sit down with her. She's tied down to the chair. She has no way to run away. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> because I would be running away. Um, what would you tell her? Oh, man. Hmm. Well, I would say to start that your knee will heal because right after I turned 16, I had knee surgery. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. <laughs> and missed a dance recital and I thought my life was over. Oh, okay. So I would say that um, it's, uh, oh, man. What did I tell my 16 self? Oh, that is tough. <laughs> I know I ask these big questions to people all the time. And I think um, if I could tell my 16 year old self anything, it would be to stay true to yourself and love yourself because you're amazing. Mm. Yes, you're so worthy, right? Yeah. Um, wow. Kelly, thank you so much for speaking your truth. Um, thank you for showing up the way you're showing up. And I, I can't wait what else there is to come from you as, as a mother, as a, as a businesswoman, as a leader. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Hey, you guys, if anything resonated with you, and I, I really, truly hope that some of these parts really have struck a chord in you it would mean the world to us if you let us know you can either dm kelly or myself or you just um put it on your stories tell us what else you want to hear what really resonated with you what don't you agree with i want to know that too don't you yeah i want to know what really upset you um because it is my mission to lean into more of these things too to understand well if we get offended, why is that actually? And is that a story that we're telling ourselves that we could possibly rewrite and therefore um, take different actions and, and form a different life around it? So we are sending you so much love. 
thank you for tuning in. Um, write us a review. That will be awesome. And take us in your stories. Till later. Bye bye. Thank you so much for listening. If this message resonates with you, please pass it on to someone who needs to hear this right now. And if you like what you've heard, your feedback will go a very long way. If you just take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review, that would mean the world to me. Till next time, point at yourself to rise to all that you are capable of.